to speak about one word, a very important word used in parables, used by analogy in sacred scripture, particularly in the New Testament, used by Jesus in the gospel, used by St. Paul in his epistle. It is the word that we render as a leaven or yeast. I can't claim to be an expert in baking with leaven unless uh, I'm doing something on a smoker or a barbecue where I really don't do any cooking. In fact, uh, years ago when I lived with a community of priests, there was a, a machine on the counter that was uh, making some rumbling noises and moving a bit, and I opened the lid on it to see what was happening inside. It was a bread maker. I opened it at the critical moment, and that uh, bread never rose. And uh, the priest never spoke to me again after that who was making the bread. But I do know something about leaven when it comes to sacred scripture and how it is used by our Lord and the blessed apostle. Leaven can be used as an image for something good or for something evil. Same word, the same concept for good or for evil. In the gospel which we just heard, Jesus speaks of leaven in its good sense, the best of senses. He uses it in a simple parable or analogy to describe the kingdom of heaven here on earth, how it begins as something so small or not really or barely visible or known and then it increases just as leaven unseen will cause an entire loaf of bread to rise to something so much larger. So he says leaven represents the kingdom of heaven here on earth especially as founded by Christ. And we can see how that leaven permeated first uh, at Jerusalem and then began to spread to the ends of the earth and it will continue until the end of time. We can see the effect of leaven in a pagan Roman empire which at first sought to destroy true religion, put to death so many saints, but the church could not be crushed or stopped. The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. It is part of the leaven. And within a few centuries, pagan Rome had become the Holy Roman Empire. That leaven is the revelation of God, the teaching of the church, the activity of the apostles and others. It is the power of grace. It is the visible power of the Holy Spirit and its invisible power as well. That's leaven in its best sense. On the other hand, leaven is used for the spread of evil something contrary to truth. Jesus also used the word leaven in this context when he warned his disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees, the Pharisees who were regarded as the great leaders and their scribes as the great teachers, the early rabbis. Beware their leaven. Beware their false practices their preoccupations, the fact that they, with others, would seek to lead the people away from Christ and turn them against Christ. Blessed Paul speaks of leaven in his letter 
to the Christians at Corinth. He speaks of it as something evil. There was a terribly immoral situation there at Corinth. A baptized Christian man living with his father's wife. We know no more about it than that. St. Paul demands that the community, in his name, cast that individual out of the community. The possibility that in the end that man's soul might be saved, having been handed over to the prince of the world without the spiritual supernatural protection of the church, but more importantly, that the community, the Christian community there, would not be corrupted by the presence and the activity of this immoral man and others like him. St. Paul uses the image of the ancient Israelites who were ordered to remove leaven from their homes as they prepared to be delivered by God in the great Exodus event. And to his day, and even to this day, Orthodox Jews still remove leaven from their homes when they prepare for the Passover. Rid yourself of the leaven, blessed Paul writes. As you remove leaven from the bread and from your homes, rid the Christian community of this evil leaven, lest his example and others will spread, affect the entire Christian community. Leaven, for good or for evil, will spread. Recently, the Bishop of Rome, that is the title that he seems to prefer, spoke for nearly an hour in the city of Florence, of Italy, the official Vatican spokesman described his 50-minute uh, talk, principally to clergy there and others, as the Pope Francis' vision for a new humanism in Christ Jesus. Many have taken issue with some of what was said, if not much of what was said, in those 49 minutes. Among other things, and I'm quoting now, the Bishop of Rome said this, may the church be a leaven for dialogue, encounter unity. Indeed, our very formulations of faith are the fruit of dialogue and encounter between different cultures, communities, and claims. We must not be afraid of dialogue. On the contrary, it is precisely comparison and criticism that helps us to preserve theology from being transformed into ideology. And also remember that the best way to engage in dialogue is not that of speaking and discussing, but rather of doing something together, constructing something, making projects not alone among Catholics, but along with all people of goodwill. I suggest that this sort of leaven ultimately is not of good. It is more the leaven that Blessed Paul warns us about and Jesus Christ himself, the leaven of dialogue and encounter and attempts at unity with a fallen world. Let me give a modern example of this sort of leaven, the leaven of dialogue, encounter, and unity in our own nation. There has been far too much dialogue of too many in the church with the fallen world such that instead of the spread of the kingdom of God, we have the spread of the kingdom of the prince of darkness, the prince of this world. Very recent Pew Center study, which was published, has some interesting statistics in. Whether or not they're entirely accurate or not, they're probably close enough. 
And in this study, which spans now seven years and will continue, one of the issues that was studied is the openness of Christian organizations, and their definition of Christian is not ours. There is only one church, the Catholic Church, but they include mainstream Protestantism, they include evangelicals, they include Mormons, they include Jehovah's Witnesses, but of these multiple groups that are under the umbrella of Christianity, they wanted to know which groups and to what degree they are accepting of homosexual behavior and whether or not members of these uh, Christian organizations believe that society should accept open homosexuality. At the very top of the group of uh, these Christian denominations and cults, at the very top, those who are most open to homosexuality and believe that society should accept it are Roman Catholics. According to this study, 70% of American Catholics, or those who identify themselves as Catholic, believe that active homosexuality should be accepted by society. 70%. And that was 2014. I dare say that number is probably higher now as we approach the end of 2015. So guess which group is at the very bottom, which is a good thing in this case. Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, which are not even regarded as Christian by Protestants, 16%. Only 16% believe that uh, it is moral to be openly homosexual and that society should accept it. Next from the lowest are the Mormons. Again, not even regarded as Christian by Protestants. A cult, 30%. So here we are clearly at the top. And I submit it is because of the leaven in the evil sense which has infected Roman Catholics of the United States that we find ourselves at the top of that list and probably still rising. That is a result of the leaven, especially of the last 50 or so years, in which the prince of the world has spread his error in the most abominable way. The leaven of the church of which Christ speaks, leaven in its best sense, does not dialogue with the world in order to learn from a fallen world whose prince is Satan. The leaven of the church, it informs the world. It is intended to transform the world. It is intended to encounter the world and shed her blood and have it be shed by the world in insisting upon the truth. It does not matter what culture. Culture does not form and inform and transform doctrine and practice. The leaven of the church informs and transforms. And I submit that if the leaven of the church is lacking, and that's not a failure on the part of God, it is a failure of the part, the human element of the church, if that leaven is lacking and where it is lacking, then the leaven of the prince of the world will work in its place. A dramatic example recent example is what has happened in France. At one time, France 
was declared to be the eldest daughter of the church, in large part because the leaven of the church found its way to France so early on. Long tradition is that Lazarus went there and was a bishop. We know by second century writings, Christianity was present in what we now know to be France. France was predominantly Catholic. For a long time, it was the official religion of that uh, nation. Its monarchs were Catholic. That's no longer true. She is no longer the eldest daughter of the church. That daughter has died. And now what we can say of France is she is the youngest daughter of Mohammed, to put it bluntly. The eldest daughter has died. She is now the youngest daughter of the false prophet Muhammad in a false religion. Islam is not a religion of God. It is an instrument of God. And God is using that instrument to punish a people, a government, a nation that has abandoned him and will no longer recognize Christ as her king. No, the leaven of which Jesus spoke in the gospel today is the leaven of God's revelation, and God's power and grace and his presence. What we find in America, in the Pew, in the Pew Center that I cited, and what we find now in France, and we will find here and elsewhere in Europe, what is happening in France will help in elsewhere, and it will come here. When the leaven of the church is not actively spreading, then it will be the leaven of Satan which will take its place. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.